It's a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Erin Cara. She got her bachelor's in physics at Barnard and a PhD at the University of Cambridge in the UK under Andy Fabian, who's one of the um, most prolific and important uh, X-ray astronomers. She then came to the University of Maryland. She's now a Hubble postdoctoral fellow and also a Joint Space Science Institute fellow, working at the University of Maryland and also at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Her research has always focused on very energetic astrophysical objects. One example of such an object is an active galactic nucleus, a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy which is actively uh, drawing matter to it and uh, producing an enormous jet of relativistic particles and all sorts of other radiation. She's also worked on gamma ray bursts. Uh, in her research on these objects, she uses data on the most energetic types of light that they emit, x-rays and gamma rays. <coughs> the goal of much of uh, her research is to understand the inner parts of the accretion flows around black holes and other compact objects using x-ray observations because those inner regions are where the effects of general relativity are show up most strongly and where the most dramatic physical phenomena occur. She works with a new technique called x-ray reverberation mapping that uses the echoes of light of light off inner objects in the inner accretion flow to probe the geometry and dynamics there. Dr. Carr. Thank you so much, and thank you for that nice introduction. I feel like you did a great job. I could just go home. <laughs> Where's your it's British accent? Home. Oh, the British accent, yeah. I was only in the UK for four years, so I, I didn't get a British accent in that, in that time. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's really wonderful to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, X-ray observations of black holes, how we probe the strong gravity regime around these supermassive black holes using X-ray observations, and tell you about this new technique, X-ray reverberation mapping, that was really... It was discovered in 2009, and uh, so it's it's very like cutting edge research, and I think it's one of the the new exciting things in X-ray astronomy. So I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, and yeah, I just wanted to say that if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask during. If something's not clear, if you have questions, let me know. Um, just just. Stop We're asking for trouble. Point. I'm asking for trouble, yeah. <laughs> but we can also take questions at the end. That's also good. Okay. So, this is a lovely image. This is an image that I love to start with because I think it really exemplifies uh, the, the power of these supermassive black holes and why they are so interesting. So, this is 3C273, um, the first AGN discovered. Uh, and this is a Hubble Space Telescope image. And basically, what you can see here is, here is this um, quasar, this supermassive black hole that's where lots of material is accreting onto the supermassive black hole. And it's incredibly luminous, as you see. And here, in the same image, is a star. And now both of these images, you see these crosshairs there. That's from the support structure of the Hubble Space Telescope, but basically they come, they, they come about, uh, about on the images when you have a point source uh, in, in your field of view. So this supermassive black hole, it's a, a million times further away than this star, and so because it's a million times further away, Intrinsically, the luminosity of this thing is a million, million times more than the luminosity of this star. So this is kind of just showing how much power these accretion onto these supermassive black holes is creating. It's much more than, than you get from a, a normal star. So you have 
intense amounts of radiation coming from the secretion flow, the matter falling into the black hole gets extremely hot, and you get a lot of radiation that way. Sometimes you have these relativistic jets, uh, you can see there. So they're just incredibly interesting objects, and, and I'm going to tell you about studying the innermost regions, uh, probing these supermassive black holes with x-rays, where you can see very close to the, the event horizon of the black hole. So really uh, probing the intersection of, of the inflow of matter and the outflow of, of material and also intense um, amounts of, of energy. Is that visible light image? This is the Hubble Space Telescope, so yes, visible, yeah. Is that the closest to QSL? Is it the closest? It's the first one discovered. Well, no, there are definitely closer, there are. Um, like AGN, in 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 the the this one. Have we seen a galaxy around that? Uh, they, I, I think they have not been able. They, this is all they see it as a point source. Even Hubble sees it as a point source. Yeah. So you, there are closer. Um, Quasars. I mean, when in the local universe, they call them Seifert galaxies, mm -hmm. um, and and you can image you can image uh, the galaxy in those ones, and you see, and I'll and I'll show an image of that yeah. in, of that later. Yeah. What's the thing over on the right? Just another object? No, 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 no. Up the streak. Oh, is that streak coming yeah. from it? That well, one, yeah. Oh, this is the relativistic jet. Okay. Yeah. I figured it might be, but what you hear you say. Yes. Uh, I think Centaurus A is the nearest AGN. Centaurus A, okay, yeah. And, and what is an AGN again, please? So, yes, great question. <laughs> so, AGN stands for Actic Galactic Nuclei, Ac Nucleus. Nucleus. So, Active Galactic Nucleus. And it basically, it's a supermassive black hole that's active. By active, they mean that there's a lot of material accreting on falling into the black hole. Um, and about 10% of the supermassive black holes that we see in the universe are these actively accreting uh, AGN. Yeah, good question. All right, so why do we study accreting supermassive black holes? Well, I, I talked about understanding the inner accretion flow. These things produce a lot of energy. We want to understand how does the how do you go from material falling in to this. Uh, these intense amounts of radiation. How do you grow supermassive black holes? That's a fundamental question. We know how to get a stellar mass black hole um, that's created through the collapse of a, uh, a massive star. You can grow a, a black hole that's maybe 10, 10 times the mass of the sun. But these supermassive black holes are a million or a billion times the mass of the sun. So how does that happen? Is it through lots of mergers of, of these smaller black holes or is it um, through continued prolonged accretion over um, you know, billions of years. How does material fall into the black hole? And how fast can this process happen? That's another question. And, and what influence does, um, does the black hole have on its, on its host environment? So these, uh, these AGN, the nucleus, the supermassive black hole, they sit at the centers of galaxies. And there's a relationship between how the, the galaxy grows and how the supermassive black hole Rose. And so what's the connection between those, those two? So, so those are some of the big questions in, in astrophysics today and why we study these, these accretion flows, these black holes. And then the other thing is, to, to, um, we're using these x-ray observations to, to study the inner accretion flow, but the x-rays are coming from very close to the central supermassive black hole, really deep within the gravitational potential well um, of these of these black holes. And so you're in this regime where the effects of gravity, uh, general relativity, are important. So can we probe these strong gravity effects? Can we probe the spin of the black hole? This is a fundamental um, parameter of the black hole is, is how fast it's, it's rotating. And can we, can we measure gravitational redshift? And that's something I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. So this is an example of one of these local AGN. It's a Seifert galaxy, NGC 4051. It's, it's one of the famous ones because it's, it's nearby, it's bright. And this is just to show, this is the same image uh, in, the, in the optical band and in the x-ray band. And it, I'm just showing you this as a kind of way to um, explain why we use x-rays to study these, these supermassive black holes. So you can see 
this is what it looks like in the optical, and this is this is the galaxy itself. So the optical is is full of uh, emission from all of the stars in the galaxy. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But yeah. What is the unit of measure between a unit uh, that says that something is a super black, a super uh, massive black hole, massive black hole, as opposed to the run of the mill? <laughs> well, there's about um, five orders of magnitude at least it's in so mass. Magnitude. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a well, usually we use units of uh, solar masses. Okay. So a stellar mass black hole is something like ten solar masses, ten times the mass of the sun, and a supermassive black hole. I mean, that that, that could be anywhere from a million times the mass of the sun to the a billion so we don't times. Really know the mass; it's just the size we're looking. It's the, the mass of the black hole that kind of um, differentiates these, these two populations, yeah. So in the optical band, we're, we're, we see there's, there's a lot of you know, contamination from, from the galaxy itself. <coughs> um, people, obviously, these are very interesting, and the galaxies themselves are very interesting, but if you really care about studying the supermassive black hole at the center, these stars kind of just get in the way. You also see there is a lot of optical emission from the accretion disk itself, the, the material that's very close to the supermassive black hole. It gets so close, um, you know, it, these, this hot gas is, is orbiting close to the black hole. It's this very fast velocities. There's a lot of friction that it creates, um, and things, the, the gas gets very hot that it radiates light, and it radiates light in the optical band. Um, but that can be difficult to disentangle um, the emission from the accretion disk that you see in the optical and, and the starlight around it. While in the x-rays, this is all that you see. You see only emission from, from the inner accretion flow. The, the, uh, the stars are not emitting much in the x-ray band. So this is why x-rays are an excellent probe of, of, of these AGN. And if we could kind of zoom in to the very innermost regions this is what it would look like. And this is an artist's representation, but I think it's really pretty. Um, so there we have the supermassive black hole at the center of the image there, and this accretion disk. So, you know, hot gas is coming in, uh, you know, orbiting around. Um, it has a lot of angular momentum, basically, um, and it creates, it forms this, this more or less thin accretion disk. And material is, is orbiting around, it gets very hot, and it radiates light. And sometimes these uh, relativistic jets are, are produced as well. So I said that the accretion disk gets, gets so hot that it radiates light and this light is emitted in the optical band. So where are the x-rays coming from? Now if we could probe, if we could zoom in even closer, this is now the innermost regions. We're talking about like if, 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 we, if I could talk about scales here. This, you know, the accretion disk scale is you know, maybe the size of our solar system. And the X-ray emitting region is, is maybe the size of, like, from, from here to um, the sun. So this is a very innermost region. And in units of gravitational radii, if you're more familiar with those units, it's like 10 gravitational radii, so very close to the supermassive um, black hole. And so this is the X-ray emitting region in this artist's interpretation. Here's our little black hole. Here's the, the accretion disk that's emitting in the optical, and you get this, this X-ray emission, and this X-ray emitting region we call the corona. And the reason we call it the corona is kind of this uh, analogy with the, the solar corona. Um, so this is an image of the, the solar corona during, during an eclipse. Um, so you can see the, there's no um, light from the, the sun directly and you see this this hot plasma that surrounds the the, the sun uh, and and so it's called the corona because in corona is latin for crown so it's something that that surrounds um, the sun and we think that this corona in the around the agn is something that kind of surrounds um, the accretion disk and the other um, analogy that you can make with the solar corona is that it's it's very energetic, and you see these coronal loops. There's strong magnetic fields in in the sun, and sometimes these magnetic fields will get um, twisted uh, as the sun as the, the the star is rotating. These these 
uh, coronal loops get, get twisted and sometimes they break and reconnect and that causes intense amount of uh, a release of, of, of energy and charged particles. Um, and this is what causes like solar, like this, this is what um, causes solar flares and uh, coronal mass ejections, this kind of thing. So these uh, strong magnetic, magnetic fields, as they twist and break and reconnect, they, they produce intense amounts of um, energetic uh, particles. And this is exactly the same thing that we think is happening around these uh, AGN. I mean, it's probably a, a, a different process, slightly different process, but the, but the basic idea is that you have, you'll have magnetic fields in this, um, in this rotating accretion disk. As these magnetic fields twist, um, they, they get um, and reconnect, they can create intense amounts of energy, and this is where, where you're getting this, this strong um, X-ray emission coming from. So I would say that this corona while we, we have this nice artist's representation, we have kind of some constraints that we think that, you know, it's something very um, energetic uh, and, and to have where, you, you know, it, it, so it, we think that it must be coming from close to the black hole, but exactly what is the corona? What's its shape? How extended is it? Um, is, is still a matter of, of active research. And, and part of the, the motivation for a lot of what we do is try and understand where did, did this corona come from exactly. Um, some people say maybe it's the base of this relativistic jet. We have these jets that we see in many of uh, these AGN. Maybe at the base of this jet you get a lot of these um, twisting magnetic fields and a lot of energetic particles. Um, so, so that's a an interesting puzzle. Would, would there be a second one in the other direction? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it just it'll be uh, symmetric. Yeah. So this was my um, fancy PowerPoint skills that you saw there. You know, the, this corona. We take this as as the this is our primary source of X-ray emission. A lot of the um, you know, you'll see some flash of emission in, in, um, in, in the, in the X-rays. The corona is emitting more or less isotropically in all directions. So some of those photons, you'll see, we'll see a flash, we'll see a bright flare um, of emission. And some of those emission, that emission comes to us directly, and some of it will be directed downwards onto the accretion disk. And it, it irradiates the accretion disk, and we see fluorescence um, of the accretion disk. And this is where things, I think, get really interesting. Because instead of just seeing a, a, a continuum of, of X-ray emission, um, now you're seeing spectral lines. And that's where, where things really get interesting. So what kind of spectral lines am I talking about? The most prominent line that we see in the X-ray spectrum is the iron K fluorescence line. Um, so this is just kind of showing you what, what happens. You know, you have this uh, corona that's that's uh, irradiating your accretion disk. A photon gets um, kicked up into a, in a into a higher energy level, and as it decays um, back down to the K shell here, it'll uh, it'll um, emit a 6.4 keV um, photon. And so, if the if the accretion disk was this static thing, not moving at all, you would see you would see an emission line at 6.4 keV. But of course, we're not in a static um, system. We're in this rotating accretion disk. Um, and we're also very close to a black hole. So, so that causes these spectral lines that are intrinsically in the rest frame very narrow to become broadened. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. Is the inner edge of the corona at the event horizon? <laughs> That's a great question, and I, I would say that it, that is um, a loaded question. <laughs> um, you'll you'll hear different um, interpretations. I think that, that 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 the corona does extend to the um, to the inner edge of uh, the innermost stable circular orbit up to the event horizon of the, of the black hole. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, these emission lines 
are coming from this, this uh, accretion disk. And this accretion disk is surrounded by, is uh, surrounding this supermassive black hole. And so gravitational effects are going to uh, occur on, on these emission lines. And the most uh, interesting of those effects is the gravitational redshift. And so just to explain this, I know that we have physicists in the audience, and so this is, a, it'll be a, a basic interpretation, but just kind of as a schematic, um, you know, analogy, you can think of, you know, the space-time uh, around a supermassive black hole. This is, this is a depiction of this space-time, if, if it were, you know, in, in 2D here. So space-time, if there was no mass, it would be something that's completely flat, but Einstein's general relativity tells us that mass curves space and time. And so here, this is our supermassive black hole at the center, and it's causing intense curvature of the... Uh, of the space-time around it. And so the gravitational redshift is, is um, the effect of being in this strong potential well, this curved space-time. And it's akin to what we, we, we know of as like the Doppler effect. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Doppler effect in sound. You know, you have a siren coming towards you, and as this pulsating siren comes towards you, closer and closer, those sound waves appear to you, sound to you as if they're squished, you know, that, that, and you hear a higher frequency um, than is actually being produced. And so it's kind of a, a similar um, effect happening here. If you have a photon that's emitted from very close to the uh, black hole, you're in this strong uh, potential well, the space-time is, is curved here. And so a photon that's emitted here will essentially be uh, elongated. This, um, the wavelength will be longer. And so you'll see that photon uh, at lower energies, longer um, frequency, uh, longer wavelengths, and, and it gets, everything gets shifted to lower energies. And uh, lower energy on the spectrum here is, is, is towards the red uh, wing. So that's why we call it a, a gravitational redshift. And so you can measure what the goal is, basically, is to measure how much gravitational redshift are we seeing. Are we, you know, if, if we're seeing a lot of gravitational redshift, that's saying that the emission is coming from very close to the supermassive black hole. And that leads us to measuring one of the most interesting fundamental parameters in the black hole, how fast it's, it's rotating, it's black hole spin. So this is a, a schematic to show you um, the effect of the black hole spin on, on what the accretion disk uh, does. For a non-rotating black hole, and you have this accretion disk uh, rotating around it, your, the inner edge of your accretion disk uh, will look something like this, and in units of gravitational radii, that's six gravitational radii. Um, whereas if you have a spinning black hole, and you have a, a, the, a prograde rotation between the, the accretion disk and the spinning black hole, more of these orbits can be supported closer to the black hole. And so you have the inner edge of your accretion disk will go from six gravitational radii to one gravitational radius. And so you have a lot more emission coming from the innermost regions where these, the gravitational redshift is, is going to be stronger. So if you see a strong gravitational redshift, you will see, uh, then you infer that the, the spin of your black hole is, is, is greater. And so the effect is something like this. Um, if, you have a, if you see a narrower emission line, that means that you have uh, less emission coming from, from the innermost regions, whereas if you see uh, a, a broader emission line, you're seeing more emission, more gravitationally redshift emission, and you infer a, a higher mass, a higher spinning black hole. What, what causes that, that really sharp spike? The this is an excellent question, and for some reason I took out this slide, um, but basically <laughs> I shouldn't have because you're, you guys are kind of, you're a with it audience. But basically, you know, you have your um, your rest frame energy would be at 6.4 keV or around 6.4 keV, and 
you know, if, if you take just, for instance, uh, Doppler shifts into account, because you're going to be in this rotating accretion disk, um, so you'll see a blue wing of the line, that's the emission coming towards you, and you'll see a red wing of the line, that's the emission going, uh, emitted uh, as the disk is going away from you. Um, and now the blue shifted wing of the line, due to special relativity, that, that emission is beamed towards you. And so this blue okay, wing sure. of the emission line is always stronger um, than, the, than the red wing. And then the entire spectrum, the entire line is shifted uh, to lower energies. And you can see, uh, you know, this is the, the emission line, but you get all of this red wing uh, of the emission line as, <coughs> as, as the emission is coming from so close into the, uh, to the, in, in strong potential well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good question. So this is, you know, kind of what we would expect to see in the spectrum. This is, uh, now this is just the flux, the brightness, uh, as a function of energy. Here is this uh, 6.4 keV emission line from iron K fluorescence that we see. Uh, and the dotted line here, I should say, is if we were in this uh, static accretion disk, not in the strong potential well of a black hole. And you see it's a very narrow emission line there. But there, and there are other emission lines. I think that's sulfur, this is iron L, oxygen. Um, but, and you can see now the, the solid line that you see here, and there's also, I should say, above 10 keV, there is uh, emission gets scattered off of, the, um, off of the disk, and you see this very characteristic, it's called the Compton hump, as, as photons scatter off of the disk. The solid line that you're seeing here is, is including these general relativistic effects. So it's a blurring effect. Everything kind of gets smeared together um, and shifted to, to lower energies. And this is just to show that we see these kinds of effects in the spectra. So this is uh, one of my favorite sources, 1H0707. It's a narrow line Seifert 1 galaxy. And it shows these incredibly strong iron emission lines. So this is the iron K emission line and you can see just how strong the red wing of this emission line is. Um, and this is a maximally spinning black hole. And this is the iron L emission line. And again this Compton hump you can see. So these are kind of difficult measurements to make. They're very, they require very precise um, observations. You're trying to base the spin based on, on just those few points there that you see. And so we can make these observations of uh, black hole spin in about 20 sources so far. Um, and this is a distribution of the black hole spin. Um, it's parameterized in this way from non-rotating black hole to maximally spinning, which is a, a spin of one in, the, in this unit. And this is a, just a, it's showing the kinds of black hole masses. So from a million solar mass black hole up to so it's much bigger. And most of the spins that we're measuring so far, in, the, in about 20 sources, I'd say, are, are close to maximally spinning black holes. And that's, that's an interesting thing. And uh, there may be some selection biases in there, because as you, you know, you, we may be finding that we are only able to measure spin in the brightest sources, the sources that where we have the best data. And those bright sources are the ones where the inner edge of the accretion disk has moved in close to the, to the event horizon. Um, and so there's a lot more flux coming from, um, from those black holes. Well, so, <clears throat> for spinning black hole, doesn't the event horizon get smaller? Yeah, the inner edge of the accretion disk. Well, actually, the, the, the uh, horizon itself gets smaller. Not right, or maybe I'm wrong. The event horizon is is gonna um, is gonna stay the same, but the, the black oh, hole really? in the inner edge of the disk okay. is that's and really that's what we're uh, able to measure is just where where the photons are are, are coming from. So, um, is there any such thing as a non-spinning black hole? I don't believe there's, that a, there's anything such thing as a <clears throat> non-rotating neutron star. Well, it I mean, doesn't exist. There should be, there's no reason to expect that you wouldn't have um, non-rotating black holes. Like if you have um, 
black if if black holes supermassive black holes are grown from um, mergers of black holes. So it, like you know this that you have um, so the spin of this black hole oh, and I the spin of the mean. other, yeah, and then you kind of mix them together. The what the end result would be somewhere yeah. in the middle. Yeah. And if you have like a you know a, a retrograde spin merging with a maximally spinning black hole, you'll get somewhere, yeah. you know, okay. some, somewhere in, in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that brings me, you know, to, to, to my work. That's kind of um, some background to get to my work. So one of the um, <coughs> implicit uh, predictions of this, of this model where you have the corona that is your primary x-ray emission and it irradiates the accretion disk and then you see these fluorescence lines. One major prediction is that you should see a time delay between the primary x-rays that you see and the reflected emission off of the accretion disk. And so this is what we're trying to measure. And uh, this is this reverberation time delay. So reverberation is something that you're all uh, familiar with. Um, this is in the case of sound. I think that, you know, it's always good to, to bring it back to the sound waves. So reverberation in the case of this um, example here, you know, here I am, I'm speaking to you, you can hear me directly, but you may also hear the echoes off of, off of the wall. And because you know um, the speed of sound, you can, you can measure the time delay between the emission, the sound that you hear directly, and the reflected sound off of the wall to get a, a distance of, of that that sound traveled. And so in this example, you can hear the direct sound coming right from the megaphone or whatever. And if you, could, if you could measure all of the echoes that are coming off of this wall, and you knew you could measure all of these precisely, you could map out what this room looks like without ever actually having to see, um, see the room at all. So this is the same principle that we're using in this simple kind of um, example here, that you have some time delay between the primary emission and the reflected emission, and we know that the, the photons are traveling at the speed of light, and so we can use this to map out what the accretion disk looks like. And this is a kind of more sophisticated uh, representation of that. This is a ray tracing simulation where Basically, they take, okay, let's say that our corona is just this point source uh, above the accretion disk, and it just has a delta function, just a, an instantaneous flash of light. Where do those photons go? So some of them will go off into infinity, some of them will go to our, our detectors, and some of them will hit the disk. And this is just showing what is the response of the disk to this flash of, of radiation. And you can see, at first, this is an inclined disk like this. You see the, the inner edge, uh, the, the near side of the disk first here, because it's closer to us. And you see the, the far side of the disk later. And as, you know, as it propagates out, um, it's just the longer light travel time that it takes to get to the, the larger radii in the disk. And you may notice that, that there's some delayed emission uh, at the innermost regions because of the uh, Shapiro delay there. Um, unfortunately, we can't yet measure the Shapiro delay, but we are seeing these effects of, of, of reverberation. And it turns out that you know, this impulse and the response uh, that you see from from uh, light e uh, sound echoes in a room is actually kind of similar to these simulations, these ray tracing simulations of light echoes off of an accretion disk. So again, here is this impulse of, of light that you see, and then sometime later, this is the reverberation time delay, you'll see emission from the, far, the, the near side of the disk, and this additional peak is, uh, is from the, the, the far side of the disk. Yeah. So what makes the disk uh, a reflective? Why are you, uh, and how do you know that it's not just regeneration of, of the, the energy? Yeah, so, I, well, I, I keep on using this, this term 
reflection, but that's kind of a colloquialism. It's 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 really that it's um, it's fluorescence of the disc okay. that it's, uh, it's so it is regeneration. Sure, yeah, it's it's like photoelectric absorption okay. and and um, and fluorescence of, of of atomic lines. Yeah, good question. You, you use a lot of terminology, AGN <laughs> reflection, and you know it's good to define your terms and so on. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we would love to measure. If we could measure the impulse and the response of the accretion disk, then like in this example, say, we, would have, we would be able to understand what the accretion flow looks like completely. But of course, nature is never so kind as to give you these delta function impulses here. Instead, the corona is something quite complicated. And this is an example of the similar, the same source, 1H0707. Um, and this is a, this is what we call a light curve, an X-ray light curve. So it's basically the brightness, the flux, um, as a function of time. And you can see this is uh, and an, an X-ray astronomers do everything in seconds. So it's like a really inconvenient when you're talking about like megaseconds. But this is just how they do things. But basically, you can see that this is something that's highly rap rapidly variable. You know, it goes it quadruples in flux there in like half an hour. So these are really exciting objects. So what you can see from an example like this, it's not a clear impulse. You know, in a, in a light curve like this, you have, you have your um, emission from your primary corona, coronal emission, but you have also mixed in there the reflected emission. And so piecing these two things, um, get, you know. There seems to be almost some periodicity in that curve. What is that? There is, well, there is actually no periodicity in this, um, uh, you know, you can take a, a power spectrum of it and, and, and there, there is no, but yeah, some sources do show periodicity. 1H7 is, is not one of those sources. I think maybe by eye, you know, it, it could uh, look quite like that, but we don't really understand. Some sources do show very clear periodicities. And we don't really understand um, what kind of resonance there could be in the corona. Um, some people say maybe you have like some precession of the of the disk. Um, so yeah, there. But yeah, it is, it's it's varying on on all sorts of time scales. So you have like very long time scale variability, but also very rapid variability. So piecing, trying to say like what is the ref the impulse and what is the response off of the disc is, is complicated. Do you but know the signal to noise ratio of that plot? Signal to noise? Mm -hmm. Well, the background, this is a, this is a background subtracted, everything that you see is, is the signal basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually what we're measuring. So we can't get a, a precise impulse and then map the response but we can see measure time delays in in the um, in the data, and this is what I think is 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 really exciting and, and has been um, like the new thing in, in, in these past couple of years. So this is an example of, of another um, narrow line secret one galaxy, uh, and this is what the spectrum looks like. Again, you see this uh, iron K alpha emission line, and it's. Uh, the red wing of the iron K emission line, and you see this characteristic Compton hump from the scattering off of the disk. So these are the reflection features off of the disk. Uh, and this is where you see um, the, the continuum. This is the, the primary emission. Um, and what we're measuring here now is the time lags associated with, with this, this emission. And so this is a, a, a kind of complicated plot. I show this to X-ray astronomers, and it's a you know, it's, it's it's not something that people are used to looking at. So I'll take some time to, to try and, and um, describe to you what it, what it means. But basically, you see a similarity here between the shape of the spectrum and the shape of the lag energy spectrum. And the way that you read a lag energy spectrum here is from the bottom up, basically. The emission that you see um, with the smallest uh, time here is, is the emission that responds first, and the longer the lag is, is the more delayed emission. And so what we're seeing is these bands 
here, these energy bands that are dominated by uh, the continuum emission, those are seen to respond first, and we're seeing these reflection features, the Iron K emission line and the Compton Hub responding sometime later. So that's this reverberation time delay um, that, that we're seeing between the coronal emissions, flash primary emission, and the reflected emission off of the accretion disk. So if you can take this, this is like a time delay here between the continuum and the reflected emission, it's about 400 seconds in this case. And that's about, you know, you multiply that by the speed of light, and that gives you a rough estimate of the distance uh, between your corona and the disk here. And it's 120 million kilometers, which sounds like a huge distance, but actually, it's about, that's about the distance from, from here to the sun, and that is incredibly close. Considering that this is a, um, a million solar mass black hole, this is incredibly close to the event horizon of that black hole. And also, compared to the size of the galaxy itself, <laughs> it's, it's in very small scales. So these are well beyond the scales that we could ever hope to image directly with any telescope. We'll never be able to see uh, the inner edge of the accretion disk. Um, directly by imaging um, these, these, these galaxies. But using techniques, these reverberation time delays, we have an indirect way of, of mapping out what this, what this region must look like. And all this is distorted by the curvature caused by the black hole, right? So none of this is straight line stuff, right? That's true. It, this is all coming from close to the black hole. So like these uh, gravitational effects um, Will be will be affecting the, these these time lags, but I would say that um, the the biggest time lag that we're seeing is is due to just the time that it takes to go from the corona to the mm -hmm. the disk. That's a much longer time delay than that you'll see um, than the gravitational. Um, is the energy potential. spectrum based upon individual channels in of the instrument taking the measurements? Uh, yes, so that's exactly yeah. right, yeah. But in this case, I, I, the, the data have been binned, so you can see it. Uh, there are a lot more channels. And the lag uh, spectrum is derived from the energy spectrum by keeping the time history of each channel in exactly. the energy spectrum? Exactly, exactly. So you could think of it like, um, you know, one, one kind of naive way of thinking about it is that here you have this, this light curve this is for the entire, all of the energy channels. So in the case of XMM Newton, which is the telescope used, it's from 0.3 to 10 keV. This is the sum. But you can look at those light curves in different energy bands and basically measure the time delays between, um, between the light curves in, in each of these bands. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit more about, about the actual technique if, you, if you're interested. So in the last, um, how am I doing for time? Oh, okay. Oh, we're doing great. Okay. Uh, in the last segment here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the other 90% of black holes in the universe. We talked about these active galactic nuclei make up 10% of the supermassive black holes in the universe, um, but most of them are not actively accreting. And so we're talking about, like, we want to understand what is this black hole spin, uh, what, can we make a distribution of black hole spin for all of the black holes in the universe? But the only way that we have of measuring the spin of the black hole is by looking at uh, where the accretion disk is in this small population, this 10% of actively accreting black holes. But are we biasing ourselves by looking at this small population? What about the other 90%? So one way of, of seeing these, um, these quiescent black holes, they're called, if they're not active, they're quiescent black holes, um, is if a very special um, thing happens, and, and that's a tidal disruption event. So this is work um, that we had published in Nature uh, this summer, and looking at this reverberation in a tidal disruption event. So a tidal disruption event is where you have a, a, just a normal star gets too close to a supermassive black hole. And the tidal forces from this, the strong potential well of this supermassive black hole are stronger than um, the self-gravity of this star. And the star can't support itself anymore and it, it gets ripped apart. 
And so some of the material um, from this star then accretes onto this, onto this black hole. And so this black hole that was a quiescent black hole with not a lot of material um, accreting onto it becomes, um, becomes active for this short amount of time. And these tidal disruption events are just are an amazing thing because they really offer a way of probing, like a, a, one of our only ways of probing these um, quiescent supermassive black holes. And also what's nice about them is that you know exactly what the material was um, falling into the black hole. So it, it's, it's kind of this nice environment, like this pristine environment, and you know like half of, um, you know, like at most, the mass of one star has fallen into the black hole. And, um, and you can see how material falls into a black hole in this kind of pristine environment. So this is the case of SWIFT J1644. This is uh, one of the most well-known tidal disruption events. Here's the star. There's the supermassive black hole at the center. This is an artist's interpretation. This is an event that happened in 2011. And they saw this, um, basically, as the material accreted onto the black hole, it formed this accretion disk. And it, even in this case, it launched these relativistic jets. Now, the emission coming from this, um, uh, from this, from this system was, was so great. And it was much more than, than they thought even possible um, could be produced from accretion onto a supermassive black hole. And so what they figured was because there's so much, you know, if you assumed that that, that emission was not only coming um, at us, but just emitting isotropically, it would be just an, just an unfathomable amount of, of radiation coming from this accretion disk system. So what, what um, astronomers thought at the time is that, well, maybe uh, this is a source that is face on towards us and this jet is pointing right at us and the, and the accretion disk is, is, is face on to us. So this is a really exciting um, event that happened, and it's a it's a new probe of, of a different kind of accretion, um, and where you see accretion happening very quickly onto this supermassive black hole. Yeah. What is the duration of this simulation here? How, how long from beginning of the event? Yeah. No, that's a that's a great question. So this is not a real simulation. This is just an artist's right. interpretation. But um, so typically these titles. You know, like from the um, the time that the, the disruption happens to the formation of the secretion disk, um, it's about a month. And you see the secretion disk for about, um, you know, 100, 200 days. And then eventually it gets basically at the beginning of the phase, um, so much material is falling into the black hole at once. And it doesn't... Um, and, and you see, it's 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 incredibly luminous, and and as the you know the it decays over time, uh, it gets dimmer and dimmer as as the material just falls into the black hole, and eventually there's no more fuel for the black hole, and it just turns off again. So these are really exciting, uh, hot events in in the astronomy world right now. How's uh, that flash coming up right now? Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that too. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I have no idea. I mean, uh, honestly, like, it's that's where the star pops. That's what the star pops and it, it breaks yeah, open. Yeah, like it balloon. pops exactly. Like it's a balloon. <laughs> um, and the possible I actually, gravity is triggering a nova of the approaching star. No. I don't. You know, I think that it was. I'm not even sure, like, why it even looks like a banana, like. It's just like it, this isn't my favorite um, artist's interpretation, I would say. But you know, it does kind of get the point across that this that the secretion just forms and it launches these jets and all that. Yeah, of course, you do always have to be careful about not trusting an artist's conception too far. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, I, I can kind of see why it might they draw out into sort of a banana shape they, mm -hmm. by, as the the. From the tidal force as it's orbiting, but right. then I, I, I don't get that that flash. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. So this was a very special event, and and the thing that was in, very special about it was that it was caught early, um, 
and like basically it was detected by this uh, X-ray telescope that is uh, monitoring the, the sky, and and as soon as they saw this, it it, it it basically went from zero flux to like you know it, it, it increased in like you know, five orders of magnitude in flux or something like that. In, in the time scale of, of a few days. And so everybody got really excited and all of the X-ray telescopes pointed um, at, this, at this observation. So we've got really good coverage of this, of this particular event. And so what we find is that this is a, you know, all of this data had been taken in 2011 and people looked at the spectrum uh, and and looked and someone even saw, thought that they saw periodicities in the light curve, uh, but nobody had looked at the time lags. And so what was cool was that this data was just lying around the archive, all of the data in the NASA uh, um, taken with the NASA and the European Space Agency telescopes becomes public um, after a certain amount of time. And so anyone can look at this data. And so what I was what I did was. Um, Basically, we've had we've been very successful at using this reverberation technique to look at these AGN, these active galaxies. Why not try it out on this famous tidal disruption event? And this is what we found. And it was a uh, very surprising because if you if you remember back on the uh, the AGN, this is the same lag as a function of of energy. This is slightly lower, going to sl slightly lower energies now. But you see, there is this iron K lag associated. You see the response of the continuum first and the iron line responding later and there's a time delay of about 100 seconds there. And you remember there's all these other emission lines that you can't really resolve out. Um, I had written down the right ascension in 1644. Yeah. Now, now it says 1544, which is right. Oh, that's a typo. I'm sorry. Okay. 1644. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. And if you're uh, more familiar, if you, if you're, yeah. you feel more comfortable thinking about these in, in the time, like in terms of the light curves themselves, <coughs> what was really cool and what made me feel very confident in this result is that you can see the time lag directly in the light curves. So this is, again, the, the counts. Um, the brightness is a function of time. You see it's, it's a very highly variable source. And you can look at the, uh, the light curve in different energy bands. So here is the, the light curve. The blue is the light curve in the band dominated by the continuum, where you see a lot of the primary coronal emission. And the red is where you see um, the, the, the energy band dominated by, by the emission lines reflected light. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see that the line is always responding after the continuum. So that is, is directly in the light curve, you can see the lags. Um, but, but basically, we learn more quantitatively by, by a plot like this. Um, but it's nice confirmation that at least we can see it directly in the light curve. And also, looking at the spectrum, if you just make a regular spectrum of this source, um, this is basically all of the, the, the this is brightness is a function of energy, um, and you know there is the coronal emission and the reflected emission in, in, a, in together in a plot like this. If you take a model for the, the continuum, the coronal emission, and you divide the data by this model, these are the residuals that you get, and you see that there is this emission line it's a weak emission line, but the peak of the line is at 8 keV, which is the same peak of the line uh, that we see in the lags. So this was another at 8 keV. So nice confirmation that we're seeing this in both the time lags and the energy spectrum. But you may, if you're if you're paying attention, you may notice, you know, I said that the iron K emission line happened at 6.4 keV, but we're seeing this emission at 8 keV. It's a very blue shifted line. And we were really uh, puzzled by this for a long time. Um, but the, the thing that we think uh, makes the most sense to us is this is, is how we interpret this. So in this initial phase, at the beginning of this um, tidal disruption event, the material is falling in very quickly. It forms this, this accretion disk system. But this is an incredibly, like an, an extraordinarily um, luminous um, accretion disk system. It's, it's, a, it's a super Eddington accretion disk system, if you're familiar with that term. 
And basically, there's so much radiation coming from this, um, from this, uh, from the disk itself that it's theoretically um, models uh, predict that, mm. that if there's so much radiation coming from this secretion disk, that the radiation is able to lift material off of the disk and creates these outflowing winds. So when you have a very extremely bright accretion disk system, you can have these outflowing winds. And you'll remember that, um, that I said that, that this is thought to be a system where you're looking face on into this, into this accretion disk. So you can imagine, you know, we're viewing it from down here and we're looking into this funnel and you have this outflowing material coming towards you. And so what we think that we're seeing is you have this initial flash, this coronal emission coming from the innermost regions and some of it is reflecting off of the accretion disk. And because it's outflowing, you get the, this um, uh, special relativistic uh, Doppler blue shift um, from this outflowing wind, and that's what causes the blue shift of this iron line. So this was kind of a, a, an exciting result because it was probing this different kind of accretion flow structure, um, and and we've never been able to get uh, you know probes of this accretion flow these these very puffy outflowing accretion flows before, and, and the reverberation was uh, giving us this new view of these of these systems. Yeah. Um, so, is the iron K line that reflection you're seeing the blue shifted part? Is that the accretion disk, or is that blue shifted from the corona shining on the matter that's been pushed away after the radiation? After the matter gets pushed away by super limit uh, accretion. Yeah. Yeah. Is that matter what's going to be heating up with the, the corona is heating up and that the first yeah. iron test coming from yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Not the accretion disk. Well, so the answer to your question is both. Um, in, in this kind of super Eddington accretion state, it's kind of the, the, the outflowing wind and the disk are kind of one and the same. Um, that you have, you have reflection off of this, this wind, this outflowing material, but the, the outflowing material is, is, is the disk itself. So it's all part of this very turbulent inflowing, outflowing uh, accretion flow system. So yeah, um, it's both. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So that's about it. My take home points are X-ray astronomy is is a, an awesome puzzle. And I think that like it's it's amazing that all that you have, you know, I tried to emphasize that you know all the information that you have is the, the photon arrival time and the energy of a photon. We're never gonna be able to image these these regions close to the supermassive black hole. And so all, like the work that we do is just trying to piece together from these two parameters what does it look like around these black holes and it's and it's pretty exciting we can probe strong gravity effects and we can start measuring the spin of supermassive and, and, and stellar mass black holes and we can uh, use this new technique x-ray reverberation to, to measure the light echoes uh, off of these creation disks so thank you You want to change X rays to X ray there in the top of the last slide. Yeah. <laughs> X rays astronomy. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Let's not go to that one. Wayne is an excellent editor. He often corrects me. Although uh, I'm not very good. <laughs> he would find me interesting. Yeah, uh, massive black hole in the center of our galaxy, there is a telescope, basically the size of the Earth, that is trying to look at the uh, yeah. size of the accretion, not the accretion disk, but the, the diameter of the actual black hole. Yeah, the event uh, Can you use telescope. any of your techniques on maybe material falling into that? I know there was some that got close mm -hmm. and maybe fell in recently. And every once in a while, it does give a little spike. That's an excellent question. Um, basically, this technique has not been used um, to look at Sagittarius A star, our supermassive black hole, um, because the uh, there's not a lot of material. Yeah. 
you know. Um, so these techniques, like, well, people have, have think that they have seen evidence for light echoes um, off of material. Um, they see, like, basically, it's not happening very close to the black hole, but they, they can see, like, gas clouds further away from, yeah. from the black hole and they see fluorescence, iron cage fluorescence from, from these gas clouds. Um, and and the, 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 the idea is that that, that is, was caused, it's a light echo from a flare of Sagittarius A star that happened maybe 200 years ago. Um, so that they're not seeing the primary flash, but they're seeing now the fluorescence of that sometime later. Yeah. But these, the, I don't think that there's enough X-ray emission yeah. um, to do this, like in, in using the same kind of technique. But it's you know it's, maybe it's worth a shot. Good question. As um, as the how the X-ray uh, what's going to give rise to it's collisions, I guess, as um, material is scrunched as it falls into the black hole. Now, say the radiation is initiated at some. Then the radiation's got to climb back out yeah. of whatever there is. So there should be a gravitational blue shift. Do you see that on the lines? I uh, there will be a redshift red shift, of the yeah, of the, the red yeah. Shift. I don't know why it's uh, blue. So that's exactly what we're seeing okay. in the lines. Yeah, yeah. And the, the the primary coronal emission, the continuum emission, should also be redshifted as well. But since it's a continuum, you shift a continuum. It looks like a continuum. So. <laughs> Can you back up one slide, please? Oh no, are you going to find more typos? No, <laughs> I just want to make notes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so was, no, there, no. was there a blue shift involved too that you mentioned? How did that get to it? So in this tidal disruption event, we see a very clear blue shift. And uh, and we think that that's from because of the outflow. outflow. Yeah. But earlier you were talking about a blue shift for the... Yeah. So this is the slide that I took out that I really shouldn't have. I know that you guys are totally could handle it. But basically, um, you know, in, in in the normal accretion disks, these like thin accretion disks in the AGN, um, we think that we're not seeing them face on. We're seeing them at like some some inclination. And so the blue shift that you're seeing is 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 basically a Doppler effect. Um, so the the emission coming from the the the, the, the side of the disk that's uh, you know, if, if it's rotating like Far this. Far away from the black hole, so it's not subject to the gravitational shift? Is no, that it's not that. It's that um, it's, it will actually be blue shifted, that the emission coming from the side of the disk that's uh, coming towards you yeah. will be shi blue shifted. Well, and the emission good. that's coming from the side of the disk that's going but away from you will be... It's embedded in a very intense gravitational field? Yes. Which dominates, doesn't it? Doesn't produce a redshift for everything coming at you? So everything does get redshifted, um, but you also see uh, e even the the, uh, the the blue wing um, will 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 be redshifted a little bit. But you do see you do, do see a blue shift um, in 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 the accretion disk systems, and and the blue sh the blue wing of the iron line is a very important indicator of the inclination of this disk. So if you have something that's more Face on, you won't get as much Doppler shifts. But if you have something that's very edge on, you'll see lots more of the. Uh, I can understand the, the difference because of the rotation of the accretion exactly. disk. Exactly. But I'm trying to understand whether the edges of the disk are large enough to be outside the very intense gravitational field. Yes. It has to be in order to see the blue shift. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, the the disk is is uh, there's fluorescence of the disk at, at many different. Um, the annuli, basically, many different radii. Yeah. yeah. Um, what sort of applications could you use this uh, X ray technology for? Like, what other things can you have with this? Like, specifically with the. Yeah, like, what, could you, what else can you apply for scientists? The X ray reverberation technique? Yeah. Well, I mean, in a kind of very, if you just use this technique um, in a very general sense, these are just uh, like very, like signal processing techniques that are used 
in all sorts of applications. Um, like the other day, I was looking. Oh, I'm just waiting. Um, you know, you look at like how stocks go up and down with, as a function of time. Basically, they're doing the same kinds of analysis there. You know, we take a Fourier transform of of this uh, these light curves and we measure um, how the variability looks like on different time scales. This is exactly the same thing that that people are doing in. Uh, you know, like looking at stocks, how stocks change on long time scales, how, how things fluctuate on short time scales. The, you know, the, these signal processing techniques are like fundamental for um, a lot of our, um, you know, audio technology, that kind of stuff. So I, I think that the technique itself is something, it's nothing new. You know, I think like people have been using these techniques for a long time. We're kind of getting, we're finally using it in the X-ray band. Well, um, is reverber reverberation to map the uh, environment, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they've been using it for quite some time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. In Same terms of like what we can um, learn from from black holes in in general, I think that we're seeing um, strong gravity effects, and the the kind of one of the main uh, most fundamental questions is, is, you know, we're seeing GR effects, uh, general relativistic effects. Can we get to this point where we understand the accretion flow well enough? We understand this strong, um, this curved space time well enough that we can use these results to test is general relativity even a good enough uh, model for these things? But that's that's very far down down the line. And um, mostly, it's, it's understanding. How does material fall in? What does the secretion flow structure look like? How does material fall into the into a black hole? And how do we grow supermassive black holes, which are um, you know fundamental to, to to what we see in the universe? Yeah. yeah. So along the, the line of, of that question, you, you mentioned uh, that it was also used for stellar mass black holes, for actual binaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so has it so reverberation in stellar mass black holes is something that is just starting to be done, but it's a harder thing to do. And the reason for that is that um, stellar mass black holes, they're a lot closer to us. So we see a lot, they're maybe uh, like a thousand times um, more flux. We see they're a thousand times more flux from those sources. But the time scale of the variability is so much faster it's you know it's maybe ten to the five, ten to the six times faster because the scale the, the scales are so much smaller that the number of photons that you get per light crossing time is actually a lot less in the stellar mass black holes, and so it's a it's a, just a harder problem. Um, but yeah, I think as we as we build bigger and bigger telescopes, um, the stellar mass black hole reverberation is going to really be stellar. <laughs> Along that, uh, somewhat along that same line, given today's technology in existence, in other words, no FTL travel out there to take a close look, what do you need to significantly improve our understanding of these objects? Uh, what uh, probes, what analyses, what do you need that is possible today? Yeah. We are at the point now. Um, where we have, well, we can always use longer observations, you know. But but really, this analysis, the reverberation, is it is really just photon starved. Um, so we just need larger collecting area instruments for for for, for this kind of analysis. Um, yeah. So hopefully, well, we need really any X-ray telescope. So they they should continue with the X-ray. X-ray telescopes, <laughs> but the larger collecting area, and um, bigger mirrors, and things. Everybody, like the congressman. <laughs> yes. So how much, how much of this has been collected by Chandra? Mm -hmm. the other big yeah. So Chandra is another is the other big X-ray observatory. That's NASA's big observatory. And um, no work on reverberation has been done with Chandra because because exactly of the same point that that the. the uh, 
the, the, the collecting area of Chandra is is much smaller than XMM Newton, um, which is mostly used for this uh, technique. Um, so it's just we just need the photons. Chandra does amazing stuff because it has really precise uh, spatial resolution. But again, even though it has this arc second spatial resolution. Um, you still can't resolve these small scales so close to the black hole. So um, Chandra has its its other um, uses. Uses, yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah. No further questions. Let's thank our speaker again. Oh.